Good morning, Faith and Hope Churches. We continue our series on Nehemiah as we consider what next, trying to navigate life in an age of social disruption. I'm going to skip ahead in the series because I really want to focus on this chapter today, chapter 8 of Nehemiah, actually the next two weeks, this week and next week. Well, folks, the circumstances in which we find ourselves as a nation have exposed our deepest need. And our deepest need, you might be surprised, but is not to find a vaccine for the coronavirus, nor is it to find a miracle to unite our hopelessly divided political system. The social disruption we are experiencing on a grand scale has laid open our hearts. In fact, when we look inside, what do we see when we see our human hearts exposed? Well, I'll tell you what we see. We find that our hearts are broken, wounded, dysfunctional, sin-scarred, evil-infested, endlessly self-oriented. We discover something that no human solution can solve. This theme was powerfully de depicted in a kind of a gospel reflection I read recently by Paul David Tripp. It's called Hope. And it's in his book, My Heart Cries Out. And just so you know, I'm going to share it now, but I also have made a copy uh, that you'll receive either through the mail or here today. Again, Paul David Tripp. The only hope, the only help, the only rescue, the only healing, the only solace, the only bomb, the only redemption, the only restoration for a broken, dysfunctional, sin-scarred, evil-inflicted, morally fallen, dark and dangerous world isn't found in information, socialization, education, political solution, psychological insight, or personal reformation. But in the willing birth, righteousness, humiliation, suffering, sacrifice, and resurrection of the God man Redeemer. No idea can liberate, no power can save, no institution can redeem, restore, resuscitate, recreate, what sin has destroyed. So a son had to come, son of God, son of man. The creator came to recreate. The savior came to be a sacrifice. The blessed one came to suffer. And in suffering, bless the world with hope. Hope, help, rescue, healing, solace, balm, redemption, and restoration. The cost of it all was his life. It was his birth mission, his resurrection victory. History has marched toward his coming. There was no other way. Our hearts been laid bare. How did our hearts become so diseased? Well, obviously, Genesis 3 tells us that when sin entered the picture, our heart became distorted. And from that moment on, we're experiencing the impact of that. But if you were to talk to us personally, talk about us personally, I would say, how does that happen? Well, it happens a little bit at a time. And allow me to introduce you to a word that I think helps us get a picture of this. It's called entropy. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not using that word from a scientific uh, realm, because in the scientific world, entropy is irreversible. I'm using it more from the realm of the social sciences. It's generally a metaphor for chaos, disorder, and the dissipation of energy. And obviously my use of it is more in that direction. And specifically it refers to the fact that everything left on its own, will, without proper attention and energy, has a tendency to deteriorate. And all around us, we see evidence of that. Our bodies are an expression, an expression of that. When we don't take care of our bodies, bad things happen. Our cars are an example. If you drive your car without ever changing the oil, bad things are going to happen. We find it certainly in our yards, in our gardens. If you never weed your garden or never tend to it, bad things are going to happen. In fact, the writer of Hebrews envisions this in relation to vineyards. In Proverbs 24, 30, he 
It says this, I walked by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles and thistles. It was covered with weeds, its walls were broken down. You get the picture. And we know from our own personal gardens, it's so easy for that to happen. It's so hard to keep weeds at bay. Well, entropy happens. And what I wanna to suggest to you today is that entropy happens in the spiritual realm as well. I believe for me, it was Max Dupree, who was a Christian businessman that first alerted me to this. When I heard him share that his greatest personal and leadership challenge was the interception of entropy. I never heard of it before until then. Well, what are some of the signs of spiritual entropy? And folks, this gets serious. And I invite you to allow God's searchlight into your own heart and soul as we share these. We all struggle with some or all of these. The first of these is that we live on spiritual autopilot, where we go about praying and Bible reading and worshiping more as a going through the motions kind of experience. Or we live deeply infected by a sense of hurry and worry, hurry and worry sickness, as we travel through life at a pace and a speed where we just simply don't take time to cultivate our soul in peace within our soul. We live with superficiality, and especially in the relationships that are close to us. We become emotionally unavailable to the people around us. And the essence of entropy in the biblical sense is that we live for our own glory instead of for God's glory. Putting God to the side. Using God almost as a genie to supply and to meet our own needs. We also live in isolation isolation from other believers, resisting the very settings that would challenge and shape and mold us. And we ignore stewardship, the stewardship of our resources, not just our money, but also our gifts and our graces, in gratitude to God and in service to his kingdom. And we become callous, callous to the needs of others beyond our close-knit circle of family and friends. One writer has suggested that we all take an inventory of our spiritual life, kind of like a spiritual entropy index. What would yours look like? What would mine look like if we were to measure our own lives on all these uh, items? Well, the simple point is that we all have to deal with this. Left to ourselves, without proper attention and energy, our spiritual life tends to dissipate, decay, and deteriorate. Scientists in the scientific realm tell us that entropy is irreversible, but I would suggest that spiritual en entropy is not, because of God's grace, because of God's assistance. Only God can reverse spiritual en entropy. In fact, the grand message of the incarnation, death, and resurrection of our Lord is that God is in the entropy-busting business. The resurrection is proof of that. It was that one crack in the sliver of uh, the universe caught in a decline of entropy that allowed hope to re-enter and for God to get, get into us. Well, Nehemiah joined his colleague Ezra. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they discovered a people that had been suffering from spiritual entropy for years. In chapter 8 of Nehemiah, we discover Nehemiah's entropy-busting antidotes. And this week and next week, we want to explore some of those. Let's kind of recap for a moment. This whole book of Nehemiah, the context is that Nehemiah is called by God to return to Jerusalem, to join up with Ezra. Ezra, who was sent first to help rebuild the temple, Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls. But what they discovered is that those were simply, in a sense, uh, signs of something far deeper happening, and that is the rebuilding of the heart and soul of the people, the rebuilding of the spiritual fabric of that community. And so let's look at some of the entropy-busting antidotes 
that Nehemiah suggests. And the first is one that we all have to face head on. And that is that godly sorrow results in deep joy. In the book, eighth chapter of Nehemiah, as Edra, Ezra read from the law, the people were heartstruck, heartstruck, so deeply that they wept as he read the law because they could see their lives in stark contrast to the law as it was read from the scriptures. How they could see how far they had strayed from God and God's ways. And they repented as the searchlight of God's grace and, and God's power exposed their rebellious hearts. And they experienced something akin to grief, intense grief, godly sorrow. And it seized their heart in a powerful way. They were under genuine conviction from the Lord who was showing them the path back to life, back to joy. But the time of mourning, Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 8, is now over. Listen to what he says. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe, the Levites who were inter interpreting the, for the people, said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Godly sorrow, it leads to deep joy, and it can do that in our lives as well. When we get a glimpse of how far our lives have strayed from God and God's ways, that deep sorrow is a pathway back to God, a pathway back to a restoration of our hearts. The second entropy-busting antidote that we discovered is that hearts attentive to God's word, that that word reshapes our hearts, our lives. Again in Nehemiah 8, all the people listened closely to the book of the law. So the people went away to eat and drink and find a festive meal and celebrate with great joy because they had heard and understood the words of God. Well, that's what we need as well. Let's face it, so often in our day, even when we give attention to God's word, it's simply kind of going through the motions. Listen to what Marshall Jenkins shares in his book, Awake Full Faith, and I love that title. We assume that it's the crazy pace of our lives that's killing our souls. When in reality, it's our inattention to our deepest desire, the desire for God. And so it's important that we begin to give time to hear and to grasp God's word, intentionally giving God our attention, because that fuels our deepest desire. When we then give our attention to God, well, what, what does that involve? What does it look like when we give God our attention? It means being fully present in God's presence. It means looking long enough, not just a cursive glance, but a deep gaze into God's word and to sit and listen to God's voice speak to us. It's looking with freshness at the familiar. It's being available to God. It's waiting with the expectancy. What is it that helps you be attentive to God? What is it that really stokes your heart and your soul? What practices capture your attention? Certainly time alone with God in solitude and in silence is what stokes many people. Perhaps for you it's singing hymns or maybe gathering with others. Well, I know we can't in this coronavirus era, but singing hymns with other believers. Perhaps a walk in a wooded path or a sunset swept beach pray stokes your soul or perhaps serving side by side on a work project does it for others or engaging in an in-depth bible study in god's word or challenging some injustice in our world today whatever it is that stokes your heart to seek god's word will, re will reshape your heart and your soul well, let's be honest, these are difficult and chaotic days. We live in a fragmented world, a fragmented world in which we are struggling to find our way. So much, there's so much at work to pull us away from 
God and pull us away from one another, pull us off center from God and God's ways. And yet, I want to remind you, spiritual entropy can be overcome. It can be reversed. God's mercy can help us. Folks, in your at-home prayer guide, you have the words to a hymn that we're going to sing Sunday. It's a familiar little chorus we often sing, Thy Word. But if you expand that to the full prayer chorus, you'll find these words. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And it repeats that. And then the first verse. When I, am, when I feel afraid and think I've lost my way, still you're right there beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet, and yet my heart is forever wondering. Jesus, be my guide. Hold me to your side, and I will love you to the end. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Well, I just want you to know that God is near. And his word is the path back to his presence, back to alignment, back to help you find your way. Spiritual entropy happens, and it happens to all of us. But God and his word can restore our hearts. One last thing that Nehemiah mentions, at least that I'll share this week, is that humble worship produces heartfelt wonder. Listen to verse 6 of Nehemiah 8. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people chanted, Amen, Amen. And they lifted their hands. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Notice immediately that their, wor that their worship was expressive. There were shouts of Amen. There were raising of hands. It was bowing down. And I'm not suggesting we turn into holy rollers, but I am suggesting that worship that reaches to our heart produces a result, an impact upon our actions. This is a picture of a heart, genuine worship that flows from our heart, that rekindles our heart, that revives our souls. God does makeovers of the soul as we worship, as we come before his throne with heartfelt worship. In Nehemiah, one of the continuing threads through the entire book is that Nehemiah grasps that God is a God who is great and awesome and glorious. It's mentioned over and over and over. Nehemiah saturated his heart and soul with a sense of who God is. And when we do the same, it, it, it ignites and rekindles our worship. When I first arrived here at Faith and Hope as a call to worship, I shared a story with you that's both lighthearted and powerful. I want to share it again today because it's so powerful to this thought. There was a woman who entered a haagen shop in a Kansas City plaza in search of some ice cream. And she made her selection and she turned around to find herself face to face with actor Paul Newman. And it immediately melted her. He was in town filming a movie. And uh, he smiled at her and said hello. But his blue eyes caused her knees to buckle and her heart to race. She managed to pay for her cone, but when she got outside, she recognized that she didn't know where her cone was. Well, thinking she left it inside, she heads back inside. And once again at the door, she meets Paul Newman face to face. She's going back in, he's coming out. And he happened to mention to her, are you looking for your ice cream? And she couldn't even get a word out. She just kind of mumbled and said, and he said, well, ma'am, you put it in your purse with your change. <laughs> The point I want to make with that, if we can get so heart 
melted and wondered with a sense of wonder at a human actor. What about when we're in God's presence, the presence of the great and awesome and glorious God? When was the last time the presence of God stirred your heart and quickened your pulse? Well, again, the scientists say that entropy is irreversible. But I want to suggest to you that God's in the entropy busting business. It's not irreversible. In fact, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the seal in our minds and hearts convincing us that God will prevail, God will overcome, that our hearts can be redeemed, restored, revived, remade, recreated by the great creator. Well, entropy is reversed and when it is we find our hearts renewed coming back to life i want to ask you a question what is the result of that when you sense that life being restored to your being to your heart what happens inside you at that moment i want to suggest to you that it's joy i'm going to invite you to come back next sunday or to listen in next sunday because we're going to drink deeply at the well spring of joy. A joy deeper than you've ever experienced from a human point of view. Nehemiah would lead us into yet another entropy busting antidote and it's joy. I invite you to come back next week and drink deeply from this well spring. In the meantime, just know that through the death, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can know and know with confidence that entropy can be overcome, that our hearts can feel and soar with God's presence once again. May God bless you and may his Holy Spirit fill you.